All right. So today we will continue on from what we covered uh, last Thursday on lecture six, right? Where we kind of transition into how to use C and and what's the benefit of using C as a language, right? And the main benefit is actually performance, right? You want your program to run really fast and C is a perfect uh, language for that. Uh, the other benefit is especially is a language close to the hardware, so you have a lot of control over many, many things, which also means that there's so many ways that you can create bugs as well. So today we will learn about one way you can create bugs. No, that's not the not that's not a proper way how I should phrase this. Today we will we'll talk about how do you take control of the way C allocate memory for your data right and before we dive deeper into uh pointer and memory allocation we first should talk about the remaining type of data uh the first one i need to cover is array right i think we've all been using array so far right what is an array you can think of it this way is an uh, it's a collection of data that has the same type right and in in many languages the size of the array is static basically you define the array to be certain uh, size and it's kind of there sorry there's a someone call me i'll let me pick that up quickly All right, uh, sorry about that. Uh, so for array, right, it is typically is there to store data of the same type and it has certain size. They are also contiguous in memory. What do I mean by contiguous in memory? Is imagine, imagine memory as a space where you can store data, right? Basically that's what memory is for. Uh, so let me use a pen here, right? Unless I, I declare array uh, a a r r a y, right? That has ten elements in here. Uh, it starts from a array uh, element zero into array elements of the ninth element of the array, right? What will happen is let's say this is your memory the array will be stored in a contiguous manner. So this is going to be a zero. Array, the first element, the second element, right? And the third element. And keep going. It's going to be next, basically next to each other. The address of arrays of zero, basically the zero's element will be next to the first element will be the next to the second element, which also is next to the third element. They are all contiguous in the main memory. So the way you use array in C is you can use this type of bracket to store, to basically specify the array of certain type and store them, right? For example, int i in this bracket 10, it means that I'm going to create an integer array size of 10. char a 20, uh, going to create the character array size of 20. So let's say I, I have the array called hello, right, which is a string. How many characters here in, in this string? How many characters do I have? Five? 
And what's the size of A? What's the size of my character array? 20, right? The size of the character array is 20. So if you think about this, I have the character array of 20. How can I tell? How can I tell C that it's only five character and whatever come after it doesn't matter? How can I tell that this is the end of my string, right? Because if you think about it, this is what's going to get stored in A. It's the, it will be the first letter. Exactly, right? You put in the now character. So you first do uh, second character E, third character L, uh, third, uh, fourth character, sorry, L, and the last character O, right? And the, the thing that comes afterward is the now character. Which is the value zero is now it is it stop right. So this is how you can tell the the C as a as a language that hey that's the end of my string. What else do we need to cover before we go into pointers and memory allocation? The other way you can combine multiple types of data is called data struct. So. Struct in C is a way you can combine multiple elements of into one single unit. One of the downside of array, right, is that everything in the array has to be the same type, right? So if it's an array of integer, everything has to be an integer. So what if you want to create a data that consists of one character, one integer, and one floating point? All right. In that case, you can use a struct for this. So the way you create a struct is you can do struct followed by the name of the struct. So after you declare this, anything after this line, when you type in struct some name, it becomes a data type. The type itself is a struct that consists of what? If you look at this code, what does a struct sum name consist of? What are the data in there? It's one integer and one float, right? So these basically create a structure that calls some name with an in and a float, right? So you can do some name dot a to refer to the integer element and dot B to refer, uh, refer to the floating point elements. And the way I access this, I can do something like this. Uh, in the future, I can do some name temp, right? Sorry, I have no room uh, to write. So let me let me actually get rid of all and rewrite this again. If I do struct, right, some name, after I define, after I define what struct some name is, temp this basically create a variable called temp right it's create a variable called temp and inside temp there's one integer one floating point so you can do temp dot a equal 10 temp dot b equals 2.5 right so this is how you can use the struct you can then use an array of struct right uh by basically use an array decoration essentially this is similar to a typical array but instead of an array of integer array of character now it becomes an array of struct so you can do struct and then let's say you define this already right struct some name and then the name of the array and in the bracket one one thousand so if you want to refer to the A in the first element in your struct array, you can do this A, A, A or, or underscore name in the bracket zero dot A would refer to the int element of the first struct in the array some name, right? So if you kind of visualize this in memory, right? Again, memory. This is basically, it's going to look like this. A R R of zero, which has the A elements and B elements, followed by A R R of one, 
A elements of the AR of one, right, and B elements, followed by ARR of two, which consists of A and B, the integer and a floating point, right? So this is essentially how you can visualize where where your data is inside the main memory after you create, for example, this array of struct, right? And you can define, let's say you are lazy and you want to define a new data type, right? That is a struct some name. In this case, you can change, right? Because every time you create a new struct, right, you have to do struct and the name of the struct to, and followed by the variable name, you can use the keyword type depth to redefine a data type. So you can do type depth, struct some name, and a new name for the data type. Then you can use this new name, ARR name, to replace struct some name. This basically allow you to redeclare the data type, right? And in this case, the data type of new name is gonna be struct some name. We will go through a demo of how these can be useful in the future on Thursday when we do a demo for one of the data structure we call linked list, right? On Thursday, we show that. Today, I'll show how a demo again to use how to use pointer, which is a, a, a something a little bit more basic compared to a linked list, right? So the majority of the rest of today's class, we're gonna focus on this concept of a pointer, right? And when you talk about pointer, we have to think about how does C as a language actually store the data, right? And actually, how does any language store its data, right? Because we kind of established earlier that every single piece of data or variable that you use in a program, they are stored somewhere in the main memory. What is the main mem memory? Can someone tell me what's the main memory? Anyone here buy like uh, have built your own computer before, like buy a motherboard, CPU, and put things together, or at least like select like a laptop and look at the specs and decide like which one you should buy. How many of you have done that before? So for those of you who did it before, right? For those of you who tried before, and for those of you who haven't really think about it, but you buy, you definitely own something, right? It can be a phone, a tablet, a computer, right? Every devices that you own in order to join this WebEx meeting has the main memory. So for your laptop, what's the typical size of the main memory? It can be between four gigabyte, eight gigabyte, sixteen gigabyte, right? So these are typical size of like modern day laptop as of now. And imagine that actually the the need, like why do you even bother having a lot of memory? Is this every time you run something, run any program, the program is stored in the main memory, as we already covered right, on the Linux part. Every single piece of variable that you use in a program also is stored in your main memory. So that's where that's where your data is, right? Whenever you use the data, that's in the main memory. In order to know the location of the data, every single piece of the data would have its own address. Think about it this way. Imagine, right, in a in a real world sense, right? If I give you an address, what can you do with the address? So let's say I give you some address, what can you do with it? Like say if I give you, I can locate whatever is there, right? So let's say I give you my home address, you will know you can come to my house, right? For example, if I give the address of Mahidon University, uh, Salaya campus, it means that everyone can then go to that location. So this is the purpose of address that we use 
in human life, right? The same thing apply to the main memory. Every time you need to use the data, how are you going to locate where the data is? The answer to that is, well, we give them an address. Every single piece of data would have the address. In C, and actually in every single programming language you use in the world, every single programming language you use in the world, whenever you access the data, those are in your main memory. To go there, you need an address. To go there, you need an address. And I can, can guarantee that every single compute device in the world use this assumption and the model because the hardware dictates us so, right? We give the address, you get the data. So in C, the array, for example, has its own range of address. For example, you declare an array called ARR that has 10 elements. It means that you can start from ARR of zero, and you can keep going up and down this range between ARR zero and ARR of nine, right? So what if you go too far, too far, and try to access something outside of this range, what happened? You're gonna run into error, right? Same thing in social life that we are in, yes, index out of range. Sometimes in C, you see something called segmentation fault, and you can, <laughs> I can guarantee you, you will see some of these on your assignment too. This basically means that you go out of this range, right? So imagine real life situation. I give you an address, you got lost, and you arrive at someone else's home. What would happen? You're basically trying to access someone else's house without permission, right? So just imagine the same thing happening here. Also in C, you can create, right? You can create the data type that store the address. So this is a unique element of C. In other languages, right? In other languages, you can use the data. You don't really have the notion of the address. But in C, you have the notion of the address, right? You can create, create the data type that instead of storing the data, you store the address. Technically, whenever you use an array, it has this data type, it stores the address. So you know that's array zero, that's array one, that's array, the, the second element, the third element in your array, right? And this particular data type is called a pointer. Right? It's called a pointer. And we're gonna use this a lot. Every time you program in C, you, you ended up using the pointer. So before we go there, let's actually visualize the memory address a little bit more. Right? Let's visualize the memory address a little bit more. So let's say I have the array of integer, right? That has a size of 10, so that my, right, my array is ARR of zero, ARR of one. Do you mind if I change the array name to just A for the sake of like making it easy to write? So I'll, I'll change the name to A. <laughs> so A of zero would be here, A of one would be here, a of two would be here. And then A of nine would be here, right? Right. Unless that this is an integer and one integer, let's say it's four bytes long. Can someone give me the beginning address of A0, like the first address? Any random number is fine. It it basically is somewhere in your main memory. So let's say, can 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 we can we do some something divisible by four? Sorry. <laughs> At least divisible by two. 13 is actually 2048. Okay, thank you. Uh so you can do 2048. Basically, this means this address is 2048. What is the address that store A of 1 in this case? 
if integer is full byte, so where is a of 1? One element of a is full byte, it starts at 2048, where can I find the second element? 2052, correct, right? Basically, 2048 plus 4. So every time you move one element, it go by one data type unit. So in this case, the data type is integer. It takes four bytes. So in this case, it's 2056, 2060, so on and so forth, right? So this is basically how you store this in the main memory. And if you envision what happened in DRAM, right, for your main memory. So instead of using the complex address system that we have in the real world, right, what's the simplest form of the way I can give someone an address? What's the easiest way? I have this 1D flat memory, right, from byte zero up to, say, 8 gigabytes of memory. How can I give someone an address? What's the easiest way I can give someone the address? How do I represent the address? Uh, yeah, I can give the address by first come first. So actually, that's a great answer, but it doesn't really... I think I phrased the question wrong, actually. How can I assign the address? I can use a number, right? The first location in my DRAM, I can use the number zero, followed by the number one for the second location, for the second byte. The next byte would have the address two. The next byte would have the address three, right? So in this case, it basically means that the address, whenever it's 2048, right? This address of A refer to that 2048's byte and it and capture because it's integer four bytes, it, it cover 2048, 2049, 2050, 2051. That's the first element of A. And then when you go to 2052, that's the second element of A. So basically, this is how you can assign address, right? So the next thing we need to kind of cover for, for this class is uh, what's the, the difference between data and address? In C, when you declare in A equals 10, it means that A is a variable, and that variable store the data value 10. To get the address, to get where is this thing located, you can refer to the location using the ampersand uh, sign here. So the ampersand A means that the address of where the value 10 is located. The bullet sub bullet here basically technically this is the virtual address, and we're gonna cover this at the last part of this semester. So bear with me, let's assume this is the address. Let's not have the notion of virtual address, virtual physical address yet, right? Just imagine that at A gives you the address of A. And here are the examples, right? So let's say you have int A equals 10, and then int star P, and P is now a pointer, right? I can declare a pointer this way. P is not assigned to anything. So I let's say I make P points to the address of A. P points to the address of A. And I do A equals 20. What would happen if I do this? To, if you have a pointer or if you have the address, right, using a star in front of the pointer, it means I will dereference. I go to that address and figure out what's the data. So what's the data that P points at at the end of this code here? What will get print? It's 
it yes it will get 20 would get print because basically you have a right which originally is 10 and you make sure p points to this location and then you say hey a change to 20 so now p also because it's points to the same location is going to see the value 20 that get changed as well right so to use pointers right you can do this you can do int star a you cannot actually you cannot really do equals 10 in the beginning in in c you need to assign the value afterward after you do memory allocation which we're going to cover after we're done covering how to use pointer in this case a is a pointer to store an address the address points to the location that has the data value 10. so store a would give you 10. you can use ampersand to a variable so let's say i do int b equals 20. ampersand b will give you the address of b and if something is a pointer you can do a star pointer name to get the value to get the value and you can make pointer pointing to some other variable and then you can also increment on a pointer so let's say I do in star a, right? If I do a plus plus, basically this go to the next elements of integer. So the address will go up by four. You get the next element of a, of the data type a. So this means that you can use pointer instead of an array, right? What about an array? So technically when you declare an array, you create a pointer that covers a certain range. So pointer and array can almost be used interchangeably. And there's a, there's a reason why I said almost, right? Because there are certain things that you can do in array and there are certain things you can do in a pointer. But the way you envision pointers is you can use pointer as an array. So when you declare an array, you get a pointer that points to the beginning of the array. Array of int with four elements is the same as a pointer that points to the first element and can move up and down this range of four items. Each item would take n bits, where n is the size, where is the size of the data type. In this case, it's an array of int, so it would be the size of one integer. When you access the fifth element, like a, a of five, right? The sixth element, to be honest. When you access a of five, this is similar to do, doing this because a is an address. When you do a plus five, this is go to the next five elements so that you are at the sixth element and you dereference you get the value if you would do a plus five this is basically the address of a5 right this is the same thing one more notion about the pointer pointer as the name suggests it point to something right because it's an address it points to some location so the null pointer, it means that it doesn't point to anything. This is basically happening, for example, when you initialize a pointer in the beginning and you haven't assigned a value to that yet, right? This is referred to as the null pointer. So in C, you can assign a pointer to have a null value, right? So let's, let's say you do int star p, and then you do p equals null. It basically means that right now p doesn't point to anything yet, so if someone try to use P, you're going to get an error to make sure it's safe, right? Your program is safe and you don't modify any random value. You can point to nothing first until you know what you want to use the pointer for. Until you know what you want to use the pointer for. In the meantime, let's make sure we point to nothing, right? And the data type also is tied right to the size of the data as well because each data type has its own size so you can do size of right size of 
followed by the data type inside as an input would give you the size of that data type. So let's say that A is a struct, right? Of int A struct something, int A and long int of B. Basically, the size of A, well, I guess in this case, the size of this struct, right, is going to be the summation of this integer and long. Right? So you can use size of to check the size of your data type. Why is that important? It's important when you want to use a pointer as a way to deal with array. And, and we'll go into a little bit more detail about size of in a bit. Before we go there, let's actually show you how, how to use this store and the ampersand. So store is called dereferencing. When you dereference a pointer, you get the value. Right? Imagine some, basically something like this. You have value and you have data, right? And you dereference, oh, not, not data, my bad. You have value and you have the address, right? You dereference the address to get the value. And you reference the value to get the address. So the ampersand operation would get you the address. So if you do something like star ampersand A, what's this? You first dereference A and then you, oh my God, you first reference A and then dereference A. So what are you going to get at the end if I just have this equals to what? Equals to A. Yeah, basically you get A back, right? So this allows you to kind of control not just the value but the address as well. You can move around in the range of address that you own, right? So things to be careful when you use pointers is make sure to do this. Well, make sure to declare the pointer first and make sure the pointer point to a valid location, to nothing, to a variable that you, you own, or to some allocated space that you own. Why do I say this? Imagine this scenario where I give you random address of someone I do not know at all, and I tell you to go into that house. What would happen? You will be arrested, right? Because you are doing some illegal thing. In computer, it's the same thing. Every single location in your memory is owned by someone, right? Your program that you're writing owns some land inside DRAM, and you can access them freely. But you're not supposed to access someone else, some program's data, right? Let's, let's use a proper example. Let's say you watch YouTube on one monitor, and you're typing your answer in a Microsoft Word for your assignment. Accessing illegal data is like when you're typing things in Microsoft Word, Microsoft Word somehow look at the YouTube data, right? So that's illegal. It is not supposed to happen. One of them is running Microsoft Word. The other program is opening Google Chrome, right? It's a two different program unless they explicitly share data. You are not supposed to be able to look into other programs' data, right? So this is the assumption that you need to have when you use pointer. The operating system would prevent illegal access to happen. It can crash your program, for example. Hey, something is trying to access illegal things and you don't own that. Let me crash this program because I don't know what's going on, right? And basically, this is one of the, the things that we call memory protection. We make sure you don't access things illegally, right? Imagine a cloud like AWS, one of the virtual machine run like cryptocurrency and someone else 
have managed to have access to the data that can be bad, right? So think of this scenario as you want to make sure you don't trespass on someone else's home, right? You're going to get arrested because that's illegal. One, also one more type of pointer is when you want to interact with the file on your computer, you can use the file pointer. So accessing this file is done using a file pointer, right? So you, the way you do this is file, and then the name of the pointer, it can be anything like file fp, for example, right? You can do file fp, star fp. And then you can say, hey, fp equal f open. f open is a function call that open the file. The mode here, you can do read, you can do write to basically do something with the file. You can read from existing file. You can write into a file that you just open. And at the end, don't forget to close the file. Right? You close the file to finalize the writing or reading of the file. So you can see how to use it in this link. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. I have a few more examples of how to write to the file and read from a file. If there's any error, the F open function returns now. So most of the time when you use file, right, you typically, I would do something like this. If not FP equal F open, this allows you to basically make sure that you try to open the file and it successfully open. If it fail, if it fail, this is gonna return now, right? This is going to return now. So if it return now, you do something to cover that. So when you, let's say you have a file open, right? In the file pointer, in instead of scan out, you can read from a file using F scan out. You put in the file pointer as the first argument, the rest look like a typical scan out. In this case, from this example, it read one integer of A. And the same concept applies to get C and get S. So you do F followed by that function name like F get S, right? And make sure you put in file pointer. Again, you can check out the link for additional things you can do uh, with the file pointer. Writing to a file is basically as easy as replacing printf which write to your monitor to f print f, which is basically now write to a file that the file pointer is pointing at. So in this case, it's going to write one integer to a. And when you're reading from a file, you need to be able to tell where is the end of the file, right? So the end of file can be denoted as EOF or end of file. It's a special symbol, and you can check that a file is ending by calling the function FEOF. FEOF would check if the file is at the end of file. It returns true if it's the end of the file. It returns false if not, right? And this is basically kind of wrap the stream I.O., right? In general, in general, C use stream, what we call stream to access input and output. This includes things like file, keyboard input, printer, terminal, right? So some example of stream are file, or even printf, right? Printf, you, you print something to the terminal. Uh, S printf means that I'm gonna print to the stream. So you first hook up your stream to certain input and output devices, and then you can do S printf to print to that stream. Most of the time for the context of this class, you basically use these two things, either printf or F printf to print to the file, basically writing something to a file, or scanf or F scanf, scanning something from a file, reading something from a file, right? So that kind of wrap up the basic pointer and then we're gonna now transition, right? Transition to memory allocation. That's a great question. What do I mean by stream? What do I mean by stream? 
screen is actually a concept that I want to represent the data, but I don't know when the data is going to end, right? So we actually, there's a, it, at MUIC, there's a class called parallel, parallel and functional programming, functional and parallel programming that I'm, I'm actually covering. Uh, I think it's probably like a third year class. We're going to cover what is a stream. And today, we, to, to answer your question, right? Stream is a data type, one of the data type, but you don't know when things are going to end, right? Imagine the, the, the real world example of a, of a stream, right? What is a stream in real world? Let's say I, say I told you I saw a stream down there. What does it mean? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a body of water that keeps flowing, right? Something produced that water and it keeps flowing, conti the, yes, exactly, continuous flow. And you don't know when it's going to end. <laughs> it will keep flowing. So we, in computer science, we use this concept to capture things that keep coming or keep going out, right? Things like, for example, network packet. Right, you you basically are trying to listen to the network packet, and you don't know when that that thing is gonna arrive. It will keep coming, right? Depending on the user, right? You can look at the file, and you don't know when the file is gonna end unless you call this F E O F, right? That also can be represented using stream. Why do we need that? Most of the time, the input output devices that you plug into your computer, things like storage, hard disk. Uh, uh, your screen, right? Your keyboard inputs. These are things that that behave, right? Behave like a stream. It's a flow of information that comes in, and you basically need to keep reading, but you don't know when it's gonna end. And you're gonna keep reading for for most program, right? So hopefully that that explains a little bit about stream. Uh, in the Functional and parallel programming class, we're going to define how to use or how to define a stream in computer science and how to actually manipulate it, right? Over here, let's just assume it's a continuous flow of, of uh, data either coming in or going out. And C has a way to manage that. Basically, scanf, for example, would basically wait for you to put something in on the keyboard, and when you hit enter, it would capture that, all right? So does it help basically explaining a little bit about stream? All right, so awesome. Uh, now let's dive into the next concept of memory allocation. But before we dive in right away, uh, I think because it's, it's, a, it's a, another big concept, so let me do a five minutes break. All right, so let's do a five minutes break. Uh, we resume at 2.55, is that okay? So that we have a, a quick like pause because it's a lot of new information followed by another lot of new information. So let's do a five minutes break. Uh, we will resume at 2.55, okay, 2.55. In the meantime, let me pause the, the recording. All right, so now that we take a quick break, uh, I'm going to transition into this concept of memory allocation, right? So the first thing I, I need to tell you is what is memory allocation? So when the program begins to execution, every single piece of data would take up the space in the memory, right? And this is done when the program First, allocate the memory for all the variable. It allocates the block of memory for all your array, right? You can also manually allocate things for your pointer. You can allocate the block of memory for your pointer that you can use, right? So let me go through how, right? How do you allocate the memory? There are two types. Right, there are two types of memory allocation. Imagine an array, imagine an array. What is the 
do I know the size of the array before I run a program? If I declare an array in C, do I know the size? How big is that array? You do, right? So let's say you have an array of 10 integer, you know that the size is going to be the integer multiplied by 10 because you actually, yes, you declare that, right? So this is called static memory allocation. This can be done using whenever you use an array, right? There's another type of memory allocation, which is, I am not going to tell you the size, right? You can do it dynamically when the program run. When the program run, I will tell you what's the size. And you can use the command called malloc. Malloc stands for memory allocation. That's why it's called malloc. Memory, the M for, for memory, alloc is allocation. You call malloc to say, hey, memory, give me, give me a free space with this size. So whatever goes into the input of the malloc is the number in bytes, right? bytes of memory. So in this case, we allocate how many entries of A are we getting with this command? So I do malloc 10 multiplied by size of int, right? So it means that I'm going to have 10, the, the, the whole thing is going to equal to 10 integer because it's 10 multiplied by size of n. This command basically go and find a free location in DRAM and allocate this location for pointer A so that this program now own this location. The size of this location right, is going to be equal to 10 integer, which is 40 bytes, right? So think of it as a system where we go and find an empty land that no one has claimed. And that land should be able to fit 10 integer and then give it to A and say, hey, feel free to use this land to store your integer, right? So here's some example. Let's say I do int star i and char star c, right? If I do i equal malloc size of int multiplied by 10, what did I just do here? I created an array for i. How many items in this array did I, did I, did I just create it? 10, right? Now, basically, this is 10 integer. What if I do this? C equal malloc size of char multiplied by 10. How, how many characters C can store? What's the size of C in terms of number of characters? 10 again, right? 10. D actually, don't forget you have to store the now character at the end. So basically, this can store nine character, and then the last character has to be a now character. So it can store up to nine character. What if I do this? C equal mala. Size of, for the fun of it, size of int, by some reason you make a mistake and multiply by 10. How long is C now? Know what the different size of int? So how many entries did it just allocate for C? I basically, size of int is what? Size of int, let's assume size of int is 4. 4 multiplied by 10 is 40 bytes, right? So basically now you have 40 entries for C, 40 characters, right? You can also do something like i equal malloc 20. 
if I do i equal mod log 20, how many integer did I just allocate? It's actually 20 divided by 4 because it's 20 bytes, right? 20 bytes, and each integer use 4 bytes. So in this case, you get 5 integer, right? And this concept, right, is called dynamic memory allocation. Why do we need that? Let's imagine you have an array and say, hey, I want to resize the array. Does it ever happen? Like, let's say you write program in Python. What do you do if you want to resize your array? It's too small. I want to make it bigger. What do you do? Uh, yes, you let the system do the work, but let's, let's imagine how would Let's say you have to write the system, right? So how would you do that? How would you implement this? So append work for a list, right? A list can be expanded. But if you declare an array, it's, it's a little bit different. You know the size already, right? Array has a fixed size. In C, in C, yeah, exactly. So basically you have to declare a new one and you copy the content, right? You copy the old content to the new one. So you can do that as well in C. You can use dynamic memory allocation through malloc, right? And you can basically, what you do is this. You create a new temporary pointer. You allocate them to have a bigger size. And then you copy everything you deallocate the old pointer and you copy the the everything in there to the new pointer so you first copy the content deallocate and copy the address to a new pointer so let's let's say i have an array right that consists of three items one two and three and i say hey i want a bigger array I want a bigger array. So what do you do is you can do temp equals malloc size of int, right? Multiply by, let's say I want the new size to be 10, right? Then you do the copy everything uh from a into temp then you free up right free a and then you say a equals temp right because let's say after you do temp 10 basically you, what you did is this temp right and then it has 10 elements and you then copy one two and three in there Notice now you have two array. What you do here is you don't use A anymore. You can free up this space and make sure A now points to here. Make sure the A points to temp, right? Basically, just making a new array that's bigger, copy everything there and get rid of the old array. And the uh, uh, the, the part that get rid of the old array is called memory deallocation. So when you no longer need to use the allocated memory, you need to do the step called deallocation. Deallocation mark that region as free so everyone else can use it later. Everyone else can now allocate things in that region. This is done by calling the function called free followed by the pointer name. And you need to do this to avoid the, the the scenario that we call memory leak for assignment two, we actually will check if you have memory leak or not. Because if you write a program that has memory leak, eventually your computer will run out of memory. And can someone tell me what will happen if my computer run out of memory?
it's gonna freeze up, right? It's gonna slow, it's gonna get really, really slow. Sometimes it might die, sometimes enough and it run, well, I don't think you're gonna run into blue screen, to be honest, um, but it's gonna be really slow. And most of the time, the way you fix it is you're gonna restart your computer, right? So that's bad. Uh, so make sure you deallocate the memory. And now we talk about both uh, static and dynamic allocation, right? So we talk about both static and dynamic. Let's talk about heap and stack because these are the concepts that most operating system in, well, if not all, right? Use in order to maintain where your data is. So a pointer can point to heap or stack. It's a region in your main memory. Some of them will call will be used as a heap. Some of them will be used as a stack. The stack are used for anything that you know the size already. Things like normal variable, array, or even the function itself, right? The function calls are using the stack. Essentially anything that you know the size. These are done statically using the stack. For anything that you allocate dynamically, the OS typically use the heap to allocate and store your data. It's another region called a heap. We are going to revisit this when we talk, when we talk about the assembly, which is after the midterm exam. So what are the use of pointer, right? As you said, uh, as we've seen earlier, we can use it to have a dynamic array, right? Resize your array. We can also use it to implement many data structure. We're gonna cover this on Thursday. I, to be honest, because many of you haven't taken data structure class, I'm gonna cover some of those. And for assignment two, we're gonna use the basic ones like a linked list for the purpose of this class. And I'm gonna make sure I cover things for assignment two. All right, even though some of you might not have taken data structure class. We can use pointer to pass in data into the function and pass data out of the function. You, you can use it to return more than one thing. For example, you can pass in pointers and you modify the content of that address so that you don't actually you don't have to return anything. The value is already modified, right? This trick is actually used a lot when you want to return more than one value, right? Pointer can also be assigned. Pointer can also be assigned to a function. We will get, we will get to this later. Uh, we don't have enough time today to cover this because there are also other important topics in C. Uh, so these are the use of pointer that we're gonna keep covering today, Thursday, and likely next Tuesday, right? So what else? More things to consider. You can add void data type as well, right? Void means nothing. Void means nothing. So a function can have void as a return type. It means it doesn't return anything. It doesn't return anything. A pointer can have a void type. It can mean a couple of things, right? It can mean that I don't, I don't know what I'm gonna use a pointer for yet. That's a legit use of void pointer. Then, then you can cast that data type later. It can be cast to integer pointer, double pointer, floating point pointer. You can also use this for a function pointer. It now points to a function. So you can use this pointer to call a function. Again, we'll show this example in a bit. Well, not in this class, but in either on Thursday or next Tuesday. You can also cast similar to variable, right? You can cast pointers. For example, when you do it store, it means that treat this pointer as an integer pointer. Float store means that treat this pointer as a floating point pointers, et cetera, et cetera. 
that's kind of like a wrap of the intro to how to use pointer. And let's go back to see a little bit and just one more keyword that I would like to introduce to you, which is constant, right? So what do we use constant for in programming? In programming, why do we need a constant? So sometimes you might want to declare a variable that hold something, right? And, and forever hold that thing, hold the value. So when you do const in star a, it means that the integer, the integer becomes the constant. So in this case, it means that it's a variable, it's a pointer called a. A can point to many things, but whenever you use a, you cannot modify the data. You can only read from it. You can do in star and then constant. So this now the constant is tied to the pointer. So you can use and change the content of A, the pointer A, but you cannot change the address. So it, de it depends on where your const is next to. What if you use const in const A? Basically this means that it's a pointer. You cannot change the address nor the value. Right. And then you can also use const on a function declaration as well. Right. Um, that's uh, one additional thing before uh, we, we go and do the demo. The next thing I want to show you, uh, well, we showed this on Thursday, but I'm going to tell you another tool that you can use, especially for assignment two, to debug your C code. Right. This tool is called GDB. This is a really, 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 really powerful tool that even myself, I still use it. <laughs> Why is that good? It can be used to debug your program. How many of you use a, a, a IDE for your Python code and you, when you debug a program, you go line by line by line and see what's happening. How many of you have done that when you write a code in Python or Java? You can use print as well. Print is a, a way, yeah. So if you use visualizer, that's another debugging tools, right? A way when you print things on your monitor, that's another way you debug some. I actually I use it quite a bit when I when I have a complex code, right? I would make sure I print certain things if some weird stuff happen. In C, you can use GDB. It's not really a visualizer but it's allow you to pause, right? Basically it allow you to set a breakpoint. That's where you stop running. After this point, you can go line by line by line. And then you can print what's the value of variable X, Y, and Z at any given point in time. So you can track what's going on inside your program. So I encourage you to do GDB sheet sheet, right? GDB sheet sheet to actually know how to use GDB. To make sure your program can use GDB, when you compile using GCC, don't forget to add a dash G. For example, if you have test.c, you can do GCC dash G, test.c dash, dash O test, so that afterwards you can do GDB test to make sure you can run test program with GDB enabling, right? So that's it for the lecture part today. Again, the C uh, link for C manual and standard library. And I'm gonna do a sample code for two programs. The first program is swapping. So let's say I want to swap, right? Five and 10, right? Let's say I want to swap five and 10. What should be the result of this? Let's say five is actually the mean. My bad. Let me do A equal five and B equals 10, and then want to swap A and B. What should happen afterward? What should be the value of A and B after I call this function? A is gonna be 10 and B is gonna be five, right? 
And once we are done with this demo, the only thing left is there's no more in class exercise. We're going to have one on Thursday. Today, if there's time left, use it to finish up your assignment one as well as in class one to six. But before we leave today, let me switch over to my desktop so that I can show you some demo for uh, coding using pointers. So can you see my, uh, my desktop? Awesome. So let me, so this is another uh, sample code, right? I already put a sample code on, on root for section one. And you, I mean, it's gonna likely be the same code anyway. So let me start coding. Uh, so I want to write a function called swap, right? Uh, so I would include standard input output in main. Uh, typical do uh, write a main function. And let's just initialize A to 5, B to 10. Right? And then I want to print basically value we saw. And I want to print A and B. Right, and afterward, I want to do the same thing, but after swapping, and I want to call a function that swap A and B. What do I do here? Oh, in in Vim, uh, so I can copy the whole line. the The copy is y y. I basically I can I can type in y y. This this would record this whole line. When I want to paste, I would type in P. So I can keep typing in P. So this is copy and paste. If I want to cut and paste, right? If I want to cut and paste, I can do DD, DD doc, right? DD would cut. And then when I do P, it would paste after this line here. Oh. I think with the trackpad, it's probably on the putty side or on the shell side, but on Vim, uh, this is basically internal Vim command, right? So I can use this to copy and test. Yeah, you can also right click on the terminal, uh, but somehow you, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm really used to Vim. You can also type in V and then it would highlight. Right. So you can type in the the letter V, like V violet, to highlight. And let's say I want to cut this part, I would highlight and then type in V, and then I type P here, it would cut and test. So let me cut it back and test it here. Ah, oh, yeah, you feel like a... a uh, grandma on their mobile phone. Um, well, I feel like grandma using Vim. Whenever you use like a fancy IDE to develop your code and it seems convenient and I ended up using Vim. Anyway, so let's, let's write this swap function, right? So let's say, uh, what should we return? What should be the input and what should we return? What should we take as an input? A and B, okay. Well, let's do int A and int B. Right? I take A and B as an input. How do I return? How do I, I guess, how do I return both A and B? Because when you when I type in return, right? That's a great question. Do you even have to return? What if I don't want to? What if I want to modify the content of A and B? 
without just returning. Exactly. Exactly, yes. So you can make this void. I don't want to return anything, right? And in, instead of accepting the value of A and B, I would get the address of A and the address of B, right? So in this case, I would do ampersand A and ampersand B. And then now inside here, whenever I type in ampersand A, that's the value of A in, inside the main function. So I can do this in temp equals dollar sign a, I mean star a, sorry, about the simple name. And then star a equals star b and star b equals temp, right? So I do a swapping. It's a function that I can swap anytime using the address of two variables. Right? So one thing I can do is ECC swap. Let's see, dash O. And I run it. See, it's swap, right? Done. Okay, so that's the first example. What about the Fibonacci, right? One thing I can do is, well, count, conclude. Actually, let me copy. Right, the remember our last uh, sample code pip dot c from last week. Let me just copy the loop version here just to make sure I have a way to confirm that my code is correct. Okay, so this is a loop version, and the main function again doesn't do much except for accepting the number and print the result. And then the first run is loop with array, which is what we did last week. The second run is the loop with pointer, which is what we're going to do now, right? So what we do with the loop with pointer is we can, well, the same thing in I, right? And I need a counter, right? In star array that I want to store the Fibonacci. Right? So what do we do here? How do we use zip array? What's the first thing should I do? You need to malloc. You need to actually allocate some space for fib array, right? How many do we need? We need I elements, right? And then typically what I would do is every time I have malloc, I would start to make sure I put in free ahead of time so that I don't forget. Because you you can actually forget this quite easily. Another thing I typically do is if this equals now, right? This rarely happen. If it is not now, it means I can allocate. But if this is not the case, it means I try to find a free space in the main memory, and there's no free space. Modern day computer, it doesn't happen a lot. Back in the day, it can happen. So it's my habit to do this as well. Make sure I can malloc, right? Make sure I can malloc. And it, I make sure it doesn't return now. Uh, then what would I do? I can follow the same step down there for j equals zero, j is less than i, j plus plus. If j is less than two, fifth, how do I get fifth of j? I can actually, I can just write it this way. It would run. It would run because fifth of j is equal to, right? equal to fib star fib plus j. 
else, right? If you go back and look at the code here, cheating a little bit, I would do star, right? Fib plus J equals to what? So what should I do here? Oh yeah, thank you. Yes, it's not fib. It's to do the fib array. Thank you so much. So the j element should be equal to the j minus one element plus the j minus two element, right? And then. And then return value equal what? And then read free, right? You need to make sure before you free, you use whatever you want to use with fib array, and then you then return the value. All right, any questions about this? Look, otherwise, let's try it out. It would actually do something with a compilation. You might notice that I forgot to include certain things. It would first say, hey, return value and declare. And the warning, I don't know what free is. So return value is not declare. I need to first declare this. All right, so the first task done. The second task is to say, hey, make sure you include this as well. Standard library. This standard library allow you to basically call the function free. So Let's compile again, and now it works. Right. And we get the answer. Any questions about this? Any questions about this and how this works? Oh, yeah. So let me show how GDB works. Uh, no. GCC dash G. So let, let me do it on a swap function, right? So over here, one thing you can do is to do GDB swap, GDB test, right? Instead of running the program, it would actually open up GDB, right? It would open up GDB. So one thing I can do is to first, well, do you mind if I exit this first so I know what line do I want to stop? Okay, so let me quit and then do swap dot C so that I know, okay, I want to swap at line number four. Let's do, let's, let's stop right here at line number five. I can do breakpoint. Uh, let's actually stop at a function called swap. Oh, my bad. To set a breakpoint, just type break. And then now that you have the breakpoint, right? You can type in run. It would run and it, as, as you see here, Stop at line that has the word swap, right? Oh, I, I specified I specified the function name that I want to stop the breakpoint. So in this case, I do break swap over here. This is a function name. I can say break five as well, right? Five is it can be like file name colon, right? You can do break and then file name colon line number this allow you to basically stop at this file on this line 
But over here, because I know I want to break at a function called swap, I can do this. And then one thing I can do next is to print, right? Print A, you will see that A is now a pointer, right? It's a pointer because A is a pointer. Print star A, right? B, again, a pointer. This is like a, in, in, in initially inside the function call, right? And then you do, you can step. Step means that I'm gonna have temp equals star A, right? After I run this, I can print temp, and then print star A. So the value of A, now that you are in a function, you see now A takes the value of five. So if I print B, it should be 10, right? The line that you see is the line that's about to run. It's about to run. So we just go into the function. Now A is five. The address of A is pointing at five. Address of B is pointing at 10. So let me go to the next line, which is we're executing temp equal star A. Temp equal star A, now that it's done, when you print temp, right? when you print temp, it should be five. When you print A, it should still be five because you haven't run the star A equal star B, right? So let me step again, right? Now you can see that if you print star A, it should change to 10. Print star B, it should still at 10. So you can step one more line. And then when you print star B, it should now be five, right? Then you step, basically that's the end of my function call. So you are at the line right before you execute this, print F. So over here, A is not a pointer anymore. So you do print A is 10, print B is five, right? And one thing you can do is to confirm the address of A. Uh, I didn't print the address of A, my bad. <laughs> But you can see how, how this can be done. So if you want to kind of finish up the program, you can type in run. Oh, my bad. I think, is it continue? Yep. So the command continue would run until you hit the next breakpoint, right? So in this case, it's finished the program. Uh, I, you can watch, right? Uh, you can do watch point and you can kind of watch where things change essentially. So you can do, let me rerun, run again, right? And I would set watch uh, A and then you step, right? So you can see that A actually never gets changed because it's the address of A. It's the address of A. So the address never gets changed. That's why I'm kind of pausing because you can see that A, right, once you're in the function, the old value of A is some junk that, that's never initialized and then you assign the address here. It say, hey, old value of A is this, new value of A is this. You can also run again. Let me set up two watch points, right? So watch A, watch B. And then step. Oh, too many, <laughs> sorry. So I guess there's a limit to that. Uh, So most of the time I would print out whatever I want to search. 
and then I'll go to the function call that I want to set the breakpoint to so that you can watch what's happening. All right. So any other questions? Otherwise, let me first stop the recording and we will switch over to the Discord session for the assignment one and in class one through six. All right. <laughs>